the title of uh, James's paper is Mark Twain's Ambivalent Encounter with the Western Landscape. When Mark Twain sets out on his journey west in chapter one of Roughing It, he's looking forward to seeing Indians and such creatures as buffalo, prairie dogs, and antelopes, traveling through or near magnificent plains, deserts, and mountains, and at the end of the journey, gathering bucketfuls of easily obtainable gold and silver nuggets. In other words, what he carries with him, aside from some clothing, his Smith & Wesson seven-shooter, uh, seven uh, Orion's Colt revolver, and an unabridged dictionary, also Orion's, are some pretty standard preconceptions about the West and its inhabitants. His expectations about the landscape pan out well enough, unlike the anticipated gold and silver. One notable feature of his narrative, in fact, is the frequent and notably well-crafted rhapsodizing on the beauty and grandeur of the West's natural features. Twain's ideological landscape, on the other hand, shows vividly in his linking of scavenging birds, coyotes, which he refers to as an allegory of want, and the Goshute Indians whom he lumps with, quote, all other Indians, unquote, as, quote, prideless beggars, unquote. Although such conflations reinforce generic expectations, Twain manages to check crucial elements of expansionist desire through the novel's various iterations of failure. In this paper, I will explore ways in which the rhetoric of individualist lordship, a culturally perceived promise of the Western experience, never fully manifests, even as the landscape itself largely offers up its promissory grandeur and potential as tabula rasa. Contemporaneous travel narratives and later fictional portrayals of the American West frequently emphasize the senses of liberation and self-reliance which greet emigrants to the hold on, sorry about that, uh, to the as depicted empty space of the territories. Even Twain's somewhat subversive journey across the plains region reinforces this familiar trope as he embarks on his overland stage adventure. Quote, we bowled away and left the states behind us. It was a superb summer morning, and all the landscape was brilliant with sunshine. There was a freshness and a breeziness, too, and an exhilarating sense of emancipation. The direct line between departure from the states and individual freedom evokes a deeper lineage of expansionist rhetoric than might be initially <clears throat> apparent. The understandable motif of adventurous thrill in the land beyond civilization has time and again been deployed not only as a factor of Western experience, but as an indispensable drive behind the frontier's person's movements. That connection is perhaps most famously canonized in Frederick Jackson Turner's decision to use John Mason Peck's 1837 book, New Guide to the West, as one of the only first-hand accounts underpinning his pseudo-historical analysis of the significance of the frontier in American history. Embedded in Peck's description of the three classes of frontier population, which roll, quote, like waves of the ocean across Western settlements, is a hook that contemporary and later fiction writers have long used to alternatively garner support for and explain the project of manifest destiny. To Peck, the first wave settler, the pioneer, is barely even tempted by the longer term prospects of settling and continually improving land which become vital to the call of the Homestead Act and related fiction such as Jack Schaefer's Shame. Here the appeal for the pioneer is not in ownership of land at all. Peck writes, it is quite immaterial whether he ever becomes the owner of the soil. He is the occupant, occupant for the time being, pays no rent, and feels as independent as the lord of the manor. In Peck's formulation, this class of frontiers people almost pathologically disregards its opportunity to rise in the scale of society, rejecting the project of rigorously developing and civilizing the West. Its drive is purely and simply the continued experience of lordship over territories untouched or, in a pinch, only lightly touched 
by the trappings of American civilization. As a result, this pioneer will remain only until the range is somewhat subdued and hunting a little precarious or, which is more frequently the case, till neighbors crowd around. Roads, bridges, and fields annoy him, and, lacks, and he lacks elbow room. Unable to tolerate the infringements of increased settlement, created by Peck as the second wave of settlers, the pioneer disposes of his cabin and cornfield to the next class of immigrants. And to employ his own figures, he breaks for the high timber, clears out for the new purchase, or migrates to Arkansas or Texas to work the same process over. This pioneering class is far from Peck's main focus, and Turner follows suit in his famous 1893 World's Fair paper. But the specter of this will to sovereignty haunts both texts, and particularly Turner's. Though he begins his engagement with Peck's excerpt by offering the caveat, omitting those of the pioneer farmers who move on from love of adventure, the drive for lordlike independence eventually becomes the central point in Turner's mythically inflected origin story of American democracy. By this time, his frontier thesis appears in the 1920 collection, The Frontier in American History. Quote, the pioneer's clearings becomes, uh, become almost a refrain to the explicit <coughs> statement, the pioneer's forest clearings have been the seed plot of the American character revealing in turn the germ of Turner's primary argument. Roughing it, of course, eschews both the purity of character and the love of self-actualizing hard work valorized by emotionally charged nation-building histories, such as Turner's. Instead, Twain offers a happy-go-lucky mix of tourism and vagabond narrative. As a contrast with more serious commentary of the West, Twain's disdain for work, stability, and self-improvement are central features of his account's humor. But his naivete also coincides with a broader, romanticized impression of frontier exploration as inevitable prosperity, an image indispensable to major works of Western fiction, which always seek to paint the empty West as a land of infinite potential. That he is continually disabused of this impression is also part of the humor. But it speaks to a more serious engagement with rhetoric surrounding the West, and is in itself one of the more informative and realistic elements of the book, Enter Twain, Lord of the Manor. Twain's closest encounter with this mythical pioneering experience occurs when he camps at Lake Tahoe with his associate, Johnny Kay, an experience directly linked to his decision to put off his return to the States a while, the lake itself offers up one of roughing its most powerful images of the majestic western landscape. Quote, a noble sheet of water walled in by a rim of snow-clad mountains that towered aloft. As it lay there with the shadows of the mountains brilliantly photographed upon its still surface, I thought it must surely be the fairest picture the whole earth affords, Unquote. Although the peace of the lake is nearly imposed on by a sawmill and some workmen, Twain and his companion, at least nominally, lay claim to some 300 acres of pristine yellow pine timberland. Framed as a sort of fountain of youth and recommended treatment for all skeletons, Twain's Lake Tahoe precisely articulates the senses of freedom and sovereignty elevated in Peck's new God. As Twain puts it, we decided to take up our residence on our own domain and enjoy the large sense of independence which only such an experience can bring. <clears throat> In broad strokes, then, this episode of Roughing It uh, recreates a central experience of America's mythic past. And yet, essentially, every other detail of the Lake Tahoe adventure represents an abject failure to relive the rugged pioneer spirit so important to Frederick Jackson Turner. <laughs> the nearby sawmill alone indicates that Twain is far from the first Euro-American to find this place, that it is, in fact, already in the process of being industrialized and exploited. But the food that Twain and his companion eat is largely plundered from a nearby Brigade Boys Camp, 
although there are trout by the thousand winging about in the emptiness of the clear lake, and though he fishes a good deal, Twain does not average a fish a week, essentially outsmarted by a nature which rejects its own nature, the fish shaking off the bait they drop with an annoyed manner and shifting his position. More importantly, Twain uh, recreates the pioneer's clearing, which looms so large in Turner's imagination, transforming it into an act of failure. Quote, it was necessary to fence our property, or we could not hold it. We cut down three trees apiece and found it such heartbreaking work that we decided to rest our case on those. If they held the property, well and good. If they didn't, let the property go. In substituting the emotional and psychological experience of heartbreaking work for the expected physical toil of backbreaking work, Twain underscores the wholesale rejection of romantic Western grit, perseverance, and work ethic that generally grounds rubbing its vagabond humor. That is, Twain's desire for the large <coughs> sense of independence rooted in his preconceptions of the West rhetorically tracks with Peck's claim that the rough, sturdy habits of the backwoodsmen living in that plenty which depends on God and nature have laid the foundation of independent thought and feeling deep in the minds of Western people. Even as roughing its insistence on indolence and entitlement refute that principle at ground level. And based on the broader themes of grift and violence characterizing the novel, perhaps Twain does in fact take this forest clearing to be the seed plot of the American character. One way or another, Twain's primary purpose in the Tahoe excursion is to experience Peck's sense of lordship while simultaneously ensuring that nothing mars the dream of a luxurious rest and indolence bring. Of course, Twain's Tahoe dreams, dreams literally go up in flames when his attempt to cook provisions stolen from the Brigade Boys camp goes awry. Not only is his camp destroyed, but the entire mountainside above it is engulfed in a spectacular immolation that leaves Twain and Johnny spellbound for four long hours. Quote, within half an hour, all before us was a tossing, blinding tempest of flame. As far as the eye could reach, the lofty mountain fronts were webbed, as it were, with a tangled network of red lava streams, and the firmament above was a reflected hell. The absolute catastrophe of this fire, touched off instantly, as if by gunpowder, is not simply described as interesting or spectacular. Twain's immediate reaction is that it's wonderful to see and later that the fire, along with its reflection in the lake, is beautiful, sublime, laden with a bewildering richness which enchanted the eye. A clear metaphor for the fragility, the majestic west in the face of settlement, the fire also represents the utter failure of the pioneer clearing's symbolic potential. The failure at Lake Tahoe, excuse me, plural, the failures at Lake Tahoe presage another failure of lordship, the mind dubbed mountain, uh, monarch of the mountains. Here again, Twain's initial enthusiasm for the mining industry plays off our cultural expectation that prosperity naturally accompanies the journey west. But once he realizes that tapping the monarch requires committed physical labor, he abandons the prospect outright. That was the weariest work. One week of this satisfied me. I resigned. <laughs> One week each of shaft boring and tunnel blasting are enough to dampen spirits, and the group dropped the monarch. The journey west forces Twain, along with his readers, to confront the reality that the allure of frontier life is largely the stuff of romance. Like the opening stagecoach se sequence, which quickly devolves from intense anticipation into a slapstick adventure full of flying dictionaries and indolent mail carriers, our expectations of trailblazing and Adamic lordship always lose a wheel before they can materialize. Twain does provide some examples of men who have achieved some form of kingship, but they never quite make the grade. The literal hereditary Hawaiian king is more absurd than majestic, with a New York detective's income and a two-story frame palace. The eight kings who act as stagecoach division agents 
preside over an unruly kingdom of lawless underlings, fugitives from justice, criminals who best, whose best security was a selection of country which was without law and without even the pretense of it. Unable to exercise the authority proper to kingship, these monarchs embody the messy violence of the West, using Navy six-shooters to ensure that intractable uh, subordinates generally, quote, got it through the head, unquote. Even the founding words of the outwardly prosperous absolute monarchy of Brigham Young's Mormon colony are reduced to chloroform in print. Time and time again, the absurd human institutions Twain encounters on his journey never fully cohere. In the end, the only monarchs left standing come from the land itself, the peaks of the Rocky Mountains, nature's kings, grand old fellows who would have to stoop to see Mount Washington, and a sense of wonder that not even satire can suppress. James, thanks you. Thank you.